Well, good morning. For those of you that would like to follow along, we're going to be in chapter 8 of Joshua this morning. I'm going to set this over here because that's a disaster waiting to happen. Let's open with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just uh, come before you today and we praise your great name. I just ask, Lord, that you'd bless this word and uh, just allow me to get out of the way while you speak. Uh, Father, and I just, it burned into my heart this morning with, I I think it was the opening uh, song of worship. Um, Thank you so much, Lord, that you died and the old man in me died and now I'm hidden with you and I there's nothing that can take me out of your hand there's nothing that can take us out of your hand and I just praise you for that and I thank you in Jesus name I pray amen all right so Joshua chapter 8 So the last time I spoke, we found Joshua and the Israelites preparing to go to battle against Ai. And we found out that they did so under their own plan, their own power. They did not include God in that. And it did not go very well. Israel wound up being defeated. 34 men were killed. And then they found out that that was all because there was sin in the camp. The sin really caused this this whole event. And um, it needed to be taken care of. So by the end of chapter 7, they had dealt with the sin. And they found out who was responsible. They charged him. They killed him. And it was taken care of. And, and that's where we left them. And so when we pick up today in Joshua chapter 8, it would be helpful if I got to Joshua chapter 8, not Deuteronomy. (laughs) No, no, I do not. So we're going to we're going to end up bouncing back to Deuteronomy. It's kind of cool. Um, so beginning in, in chapter eight, now the Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid nor be dismayed. Take all of the people of war with you and arise, go up to Ai. See, I have given into your hand the king of Ai, his people, his city and his land. So God begins to speak to Joshua. And he begins by encouraging Joshua. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. Does that sound familiar? So all the way back to Joshua chapter 1, 1, 9, it's almost the exact same phrase that God uses to tell Joshua as he's taking over command of the Israelites, don't be afraid, don't be dismayed. I'm going to be with you, and it'll be okay. So he begins to encourage Joshua. And I, I just found that, you know, when we run into something in life, um, it could be a, a stronghold of sin in our life, a tough situation, anything like that, and we, we get defeated. I think all of us can say we failed at some point. God is always there. To encourage us to keep moving. He doesn't want us to stay in that failure. He wants to see us successful. Another interesting thing. Do not be afraid nor dismayed. That word dismayed in the Hebrew. Is kothath. And it means to be broken down by confusion and fear. God does not want to see you broken down. By confusion and fear. Or to get back up. 
and try it again. <coughs> and you shall do to Ai and its king as you did to Jericho and its king. Only its spoil and its cattle you shall take as booty for yourselves. Lay an ambush for the city behind it. And I thought, you know, just thinking about chapter 7, how foolish it was for Achan to disobey God. He got outside of God's timing. He got outside of God's plan, took control of the situation on his own, ended up breaking the law, got a lot of people killed, all because he wouldn't wait on the Lord. If he'd, if he'd only known that just one, one battle away, God was going to end up letting them have whatever they wanted. They got to keep it all. God was going to take nothing. All the, all the spoil, everything, livestock, gold, silver, whatever it was that they found, they could keep it. And he ended up losing his life, destroying his family, all because he wouldn't follow God's plan. He would not obey. I think we're beginning to see a pattern here. Disobedience is a very bad thing. So Joshua arose, and all the people of war to go up against Ai. And Joshua chose 30,000 mighty men of valor and sent them away by night. So Joshua is not messing around this time. It's not two or 3,000 of your just, you know, your standard foot soldiers going up to breeze through some shrimpy battle. They've been beaten, they've been defeated. Joshua is now taking 30,000 men, and it's not just 30,000 foot soldiers. These are 30,000 of the most elite fighting men that Israel had. He's taking the best of the best and all of it that he can, and he's going to put them into this battle. He's not taking any chances. He's also being obedient. Um. I just put in my notes, when God gives us a second chance to do something that we previously failed at, we must act promptly, obey him to the letter, and act with the best resources available. Sometimes God fights battles for us, like he did at Jericho. Well, the Israelites were obedient in Jericho, and this is a, actually another point I kind of need to set up here. Um, there are... There are battles like Jericho that God fights for, for us, and he does the majority of the work. But there are other cases like the battle of Ai that we're going to see where he requires us to do, to do the work. Um, and he equips us for that. <clears throat> and he commanded them, saying, Behold, you shall lie in ambush against the city, behind the city. Do not go very far from the city, but all of you be ready. <clears throat> then I and all the people who are with me will approach the city, and it will come about when they come out against us, as at the first, that we shall flee before them. For they will come out after us till we have drawn them from the city. For they will say, they are fleeing before us as at the first. Therefore, we will flee before them. Then you shall rise from the ambush and seize the city. For the Lord your God will deliver it into your hand. And it will be when you have taken the city that you shall set the city on fire. According to the commandment of the Lord, you shall do. See, I have commanded you. I thought it was kind of odd. If you go all the way um, back up to verse 2, God gives a lot of encouragement. He tells them all the goodies that they're going to get and be able to keep. And then the very last sentence of verse 2, he says, lay an ambush behind the city. That's all that's recorded. I don't know if, if God actually spoke more than that, but that's all that's recorded lay an ambush behind the city. And so Joshua, when he relays the plan to his fighting men, we get every detail of the battle. 
and, and what each group of soldiers is going to do and when to do it. It's very detailed. It kind of leads me to believe that God really trusted Joshua. Joshua was a great military leader, had a great mind for battle tactics. He had lots and lots of experience. And I think that God gave him the general plan to set an ambush. And he let Joshua, with his experience and his skill, fill in the details. So it seems this is, this is again, this, this is a completely different battle than the battle that was fought at Jericho. Um, God told them exactly every move that would be made at the battle of Jericho. And now it seems as though Joshua gets to direct this battle. So he's, he's really giving the Israelites more of an active role. <clears throat> Joshua therefore sent them out, and they went to lie in ambush and stayed between Bethel and Ai on the west side of Ai. But Joshua lodged that night among the people. Um, this is kind of significant. So he, he starts to set up the battle plan. He's, he's coordinating. He's moving troops here and there. But then he goes back to camp. And he spends the night amongst his people. You have to remember that they just came out of... Um, um, Failure. They're, they've they've had failure in their camp. They've they've lost a, a battle. They got men killed. Um, if you you go back and you read in that uh, in chapter seven, it says their their hearts melted with fear. These people are afraid. They're rattled. They're nervous. Um, they know that they're going to reengage AI. They're going to go fight them again. Um, God spoke to Joshua. He didn't speak to the entire group of people, so the people didn't hear God's voice and gain that assurance from God's voice. They're going to gain their assurance and their peace from Joshua being close to them. His presence is going to bring a calm to his people. They look to Joshua for strength, guidance, leadership. Um, they needed him. They needed him close. Um, I really look at Joshua as a picture of Jesus. And as we go through life and we draw near the battle and we're about to engage, you can literally see Jesus drawing closer to us and bringing that calm assurance and, and the leadership and the planning into our lives. And, and we can draw so much from that. I can look at a lot of different difficult stages that I've gone through in my short life. And um, I'll tell you what, I, I knew that God was in it with me. I knew specifically that Jesus was in it with me. And I couldn't imagine going through those particular trials not knowing Jesus. Not knowing who he is, just just being by myself, being on my own. What a horrible place to be. Um, man, this world does need Jesus. Uh, needs it terribly. So, um, moving on. I'm sorry for the snuffles and the sniffles and the coughing, and I'm doing my best. Um, all right, number 10. Then Joshua rose up early in the morning and mustered the people and went up, he and the elders of Israel, before the people of Ai. And I, it made me think of my dad. My dad lived for waking us up. I, it was just the highlight of his day. And he had some pretty pretty ingenuitive ways to come into your room and wake you up. Uh, 
imagine Josh was probably in a little bit more of a serious mood right now. <clears throat> so Joshua rose up early in the morning, mustered the people, and went up. He and the elders of Israel before the people of Ai. And all the people of war who were with him went up and drew near. And they came before the city and camped on the north side of Ai. Now a valley lay between them and Ai. Um, that valley, they think they know where this battle took place. And that valley, it acts like a funnel. It's actually, um, it's not a flat plain like you would, you would read this scripture and you'd think, you picture this flat field. It's kind of a bowl and it acts like a funnel. So your, your, your escape routes, if you're running downhill toward the Israelites are very limited. Um, and Joshua actually places groups of troops at every possible escape route that they might use. And so it's a, it's a well-designed trap. So he took about 5,000 men and set them in ambush between Bethel and Ai on the west side of the city. And that's one of the escape routes. So you got a small group of soldiers over there. Um, if I'll keep reading. <clears throat> and then I'll explain. Um, and when they had set the people, all the army that was on the north side of the city and its rear guard on the west side of the city, Joshua went that night in the midst of the valley. Um, so you have three different groups of troops. Um, one's going to cut off the escape route from Ai to Bethel. One group is directly behind Ai hiding out. And the main force is with Joshua. And they're hiding kind of in at the edge of that valley and in the wilderness. And here, the, the very last part that I read, Joshua went that night into the midst of the valley. That night, he starts to slip out and make his way up to the, the, the fortress at Ai and get their attention. <clears throat> so something that we see here with the Israelites um, dealing with Ai, they're definitely on the offensive. They're, they're taking the initiative. They're taking the fight to Ai. They're not waiting on Ai to come to them. The second thing that that I see, I see Joshua stepping out onto the battlefield first. He's the first one out there. And and the spiritual application to that, you know, Jesus is most definitely the first one in the battle in our lives to fight on our behalf. It's up to us how close we stay to Jesus and and um follow his plan to victory. You know, we can mess that up. So it's it's very important to to really pay attention. And stay close to Jesus when, when we see these battles coming. Um, so I, <clears throat> um, another, another thing that, that came out of this passage of scripture um, at me was, you know, when we're looking at the battle against sin in our lives, we're almost trained to, to look at what not to do. We, we see the things easily, what not to do, that, that creates sin. But we don't really look at what can we do to eliminate sin from getting to us. And so I was sitting in my chair and I was thinking, well, that sounds really cool, but what, what can you do, you know? Um, and so I'll offer this. One of the ways that we can be proactive and take the battle to sin is by becoming a disciple of Christ. Thank you. And I want to direct this at the, the younger people, high school age, say 20 years and younger um, in, this, in this body <clears throat> because I devised a choppy, extremely confusing illustration <laughs> to 
explain to you why you need to be a disciple. And so everybody knows, or most of us know, we've just ended a basketball season. Um, the, the, it's ended. Um, we've, we've played for months, and, and we've had wins, and we've had losses. Um, so I wanted to ask um, you guys over there in that corner, you know, do you, do you know what the word disciple means? Can anybody just throw a definition out at me? A follower? Okay. That's close. It doesn't fit my illustration, so I'm going to reject it. <laughs> so if I said the word disciple to you in a different way, this might help. Disciple. The word disciple means disciplined one. And what I wanted to do was I wanted to tell you guys, you know, when you guys have a basketball team and you go to basketball practice, you could look at it this way. You're actually going to basketball discipline. You're, you're going there to learn the way of basketball. You're going there to learn the rules of basketball you're going to drill, you're going to scrimmage, and you're going to shoot free throws, and you're going to do everything that you can to become successful at the game of basketball. If you guys just went out and played games, and you didn't go to practice, or you didn't go to discipline, how would that turn out? Not very good at all, would it? So you guys were actually disciplined, <clears throat> dis disciplined disciples, disciples of the game of basketball. I will tie that in to your spiritual life right now. If you want to go on the offensive and attack sin before it gets to you, and you want to be successful at that, we want to be disciples of Christ and we want to discipline ourselves in the ways and the rules and the statutes, statutes that Jesus Christ set for us. We want to learn what he did. And we want to put those things into practice in our lives. Because if we do that, we can become successful in defeating sin as it tries to come into our lives. Does that make sense to you guys? Does it make sense to you guys? Okay. We want to become a disciple. A disciplined one. Who'd have thought that picking out certain fonts and making your notes could make or break what you're trying to do. <laughs> it's like, what was I thinking? It's like a, a kindergartner drew these great big giant letters. That was not a good idea. You get about two thoughts per page. And now everything's mixed up. All right, we'll wing it. What was that? Well, some... I, hmm. I appreciate the encouragement. All right. So I believe we're in uh, verse 18. Then the Lord said to Joshua, stretch out the spear that is in your hand toward Ai, for I will give it into your hand. And Joshua stretched out the spear that was in his hand toward the city. So this is kind of kind of cool. Um, he didn't really talk about having, um, you know, some sort of signal at the beginning to start the ambush process, but that's most definitely what he's doing here. And I looked at a lot of commentary about this verse, and 
Uh, we're talking, you know, guys that that wrote their commentary in the 1500s, 1600s, on up to the, you know, 19th century, so 1800s. Um, almost everybody was in agreement that that spear that he stretched out toward AI must have had some sort of flag attached to it, something bright, something that could be seen a long ways away because Joshua was quite a ways away from the people in AI. So they would have needed something visible to signal that, okay, we're starting, we're starting the ambush right now. And the Lord tells Joshua exactly when to do it. Um, I, I thought, I thought that was kind of cool. Um, because, you know, the people that were writing about it at the time, warfare hadn't changed a whole bunch from this time period, you know, up to the 15th and 16th century. They were still clubbing on each other with swords and spears and riding horses and doing everything pretty much the same. So I thought, well, they probably know. So I'll throw that out. It doesn't say that there was anything attached to the spear, but it seemed to make sense. So those in ambush rose quickly out of their place. They ran as soon as he had stretched out his hand, and they entered the city and took it, and hurried to set the city on fire. And when the men of Ai looked behind them, they saw, and behold, the smoke of the city ascended to heaven. So they had no power to flee this way or that. And the people who had fled to the wilderness turned back on their pursuers. Now when Joshua and all Israel saw that the ambush had taken the city and that the smoke of the city ascended, they turned back and struck down the men of Ai. Then the others came out of the city against them, so they were caught in the midst of Israel, some on this side, some on that side, and they struck them down so that they let none of them remain or escape. What I noticed about that passage of Scripture was the importance of complete annihilation. God, we have to remember, you know, God is judging the Canaanites. He's bringing judgment to this people. They were evil, evil people who would not turn from their wicked way. God, I believe, um, let it go on for a long time in hopes that, that they, they would turn, but they, they didn't. They rejected God. Um, so they all had to die. Um, in our lives, when we battle sin, it is extremely important that there is a total destruction of that sin. If you leave a remnant of that sin in your life, it can take root and grow back. And it will come back. You left the door open. You left, you left some infection behind. It's going to grow. Sin is just like infection. <clears throat> so when we deal with something like this, especially when God gives us a second chance to get it right, we need to get it right. It, it all has to be cleaned up, destroyed, done with. So that's probably one of the most important applications you could walk away with today. You know, if, if I'm dealing with something in my life, it's got to be complete. My obedience has to be complete. This victory that they just experienced only happened because of their faithfulness and their obedience to what God told them to do. So when God's in your life and he's telling you how to solve a problem, how to deal with a sin, if we're not obedient to the letter in that, it's not going to work. This victory was completely dependent on the people obeying what God told them to do. So if you don't remember anything else, that's the key. But the king of Ai, they took alive and brought him to Joshua. And it came to pass, when Israel had made an end of the slaying, all the inhabitants in Ai, in the field, in the wilderness, where they pursued them. And when they had 
fallen by the edge of the sword until they were consumed, that all is the Israelites returned to Ai and struck it with the edge of the sword. It's just more completion. So they killed all of the soldiers outside of Ai, but they went back to Ai and they killed everybody else that stayed behind. So it was that all who fell that day, both men and women, were 12,000, all the people of Ai. <clears throat> For Joshua did not draw back his hand with which he stretched out and which which he stretched out um, the spear until he had utterly destroyed all the inhabitants of Ai. You guys doing all right? Pretty quiet. Okay. <clears throat> So Joshua burned Ai and made it a heap forever, a desolation to this day. And the king of Ai hanged on a tree until evening. And as soon as the sun was down, Joshua commanded that they should take his corpse down from the tree and cast it at the entrance of the gate of the city and raise over it a great heap of stones that remains to this day. I kind of found it interesting. Um, you know, in real time, as they're fighting the battle and they capture the king and they bring him to Joshua. Um, it was really a spectacle. <clears throat> a spectacle was made of his death. And that spectacle really just said the kingdom is gone. It's completely done away with. And, and the killing of the king signified that. And so they would have hung him and the whole um, uh, nation of Israel would have seen it. And it would have been a sign that they had a great victory. <clears throat> but in my story here, or in the Bible story, not mine, um, if Joshua represents a Jesus to us, um, most definitely AI, um, the king of AI would have would have played the role of Satan in that illustration. And and I just, you know, we, we fight and we battle and we do everything we can to be as obedient as possible and follow Jesus. Ultimately, in the end, it's Jesus that's going to take care of Satan. Um, we we can battle him, um, but it's it's going to be Jesus that that takes care of Satan. Okay, so the nation of Israel is victorious. Their plan worked. They followed God. They were obedient. They gained the victory. Okay, so now we're going to shift gears. The rest of the chapter, 30 to 35, <laughs> is Joshua renewing the covenant that was made in um, Deuteronomy chapter 27. That Moses told the people, as soon as you enter into the promised land, you need to do this. And this is a fulfillment of that scripture coming out of Deuteronomy. Because I believe Joshua has really learned his lesson. And he wants to do everything he can do to be obedient to the Lord. They don't want a repeat of the first battle of AI. So he's seeing the importance of being obedient to the Lord too. Um, I'm going to flip back there and hang on. I'm, I want to read you a chunk of scripture. <clears throat> Chapter 27, Deuteronomy. Now Moses with the elders of Israel commanded the people saying, keep all the commandments which I command you today. <clears throat> and it shall be, on that day when you cross over the Jordan to the land which your, the Lord your God is going to give you, you shall set up for yourselves large stones and whitewash them with lime. And you shall write on them all the words of the law 
and when you have crossed over, that you may enter into the land which God is giving you, a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord promised your fathers. Therefore it shall be, when you have crossed over the Jordan, and this is important, therefore it shall be, when you have crossed over the Jordan, that on Mount Ebal, you shall set up these stones which I command you today, and you shall whitewash them with lime. Okay, so Joshua, he knows that this command has been made, but they have not done it yet. And so he decides, you know, <clears throat> we're doing really good with our obedience right now. Let's, let's take care of some stuff. <clears throat> so Joshua built an altar to the Lord God of Israel in Mount Abel. As Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded the children of Israel, as it is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of whole stones over which no man has wielded an iron tool, and they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord, sacrificed peace offerings on it. Okay, so um, they're to build it out of stones that workmen hadn't touched. It can't be chiseled, carved. It's just rocks that God provides. Why would they do that? God does not want to share the glory in this with somebody looking at that altar and saying, man, George did a really good job with his tuck and roll carving and scroll work and everything else that, that, that they'd done. It, it was about God. This altar is going to be used for burnt offerings and peace offerings to forgive sin. It is Sin is not forgiven or taken care of by any work that man can do. It's God alone. It's, it, he is the only one that can forgive sins. So man was not to mess with that altar. And there in the presence of the children of Israel, he wrote on the stones a copy of the law of Moses, which he had written. And that was confusing to me because <clears throat> I saw some of the altars that were built down in, in Israel that have survived over time. Some of them were built out of round river looking rock. And I thought that would be a pain trying to write the law on, on that rock like that. And um, when you read in Deuteronomy, it gives you a little bit more detail. Those large stones in that passage of scripture I read you in chapter 27, they were big, big, flat stones, three of them. The writing went on that. This passage of scripture, if you're not careful, you'll think they're trying to write on the altar itself which didn't make sense to me. Nor, you know, they weren't supposed to do anything to it, and then now they're, they're whitewashing it. The altar didn't get whitewashed. It was three separate stones with big flat surfaces so that the whitewash set a background so that the dark lettering, you know, could be seen better from a long ways away. And that is what they're doing. Here, was anybody else confused? No. <laughs> um, sacrifice, peace offerings. <clears throat> they wrote on the stones. Then all Israel, with their elders, their officers, and judges, stood on either side of the ark before the priests, the Levites, who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord the stranger, as well as he who was born among them. Half of them were in front of Mount Gerizim, and half of them in front of Mount Ebal, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded that they should bless the people of Israel. Again, 
to really get the full effect of this, you gotta you you have to read in Deuteronomy 27. I'm not going to because we we got to move, but um, it's the most beautiful picture. If you had time to study this <clears throat> and do a little bit of research on it, because um, I I just thought it was so cool. So this place that they're doing this at was 20 to 25 miles away from AI. So they had to pick up the camp. This wasn't easy to do. They had to pick up the camp, move the entire nation 20 to 25 miles away to where God told them to build the altar. And it's the coolest location. <clears throat> um, I'm looking around. A lot of people, uh, how many people have gone over to Dufer to the, the, the football um, tournament. How many people have, you know, and you didn't have to be at the football tournament. That's not the important part. If you were over by Dufer at any point in your life and you, you get over by where the town is and you look to the south, west, it'd be more, more west. Mount Hood just juts right up off of the, off of the valley floor. And it's one of the most impressive things um, that I've seen. It's it's just if the lighting is right, if the sun is right, the sky is right, it is absolutely gorgeous. It is a majestic spectacle. You look out over the rolling wheat fields, and then you got the the awesome blue sky and 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 the snow covered peak that just it seems to go for miles up in the air. It's it's pretty amazing. Um. I would imagine that this would be like that. Um, Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal are they're side by side, so it'd be like two Mount Hoods. And I realize these mountains aren't as big as Mount Hood, but you get what I'm trying to say. And then the the rolling hills below the mountains form this natural amphitheater. So everybody would have heard as I read on further. They're going to read the word of God to the people all the law of Moses, and they would have been able to hear. And then they would have, where they built the altar on Mount Ebal, they could see what was going on up there, what the priests and Joshua were doing. Um, it was really a grand, grand event. And then something else that was really cool was, um, have you ever been in a church? We don't do it. I don't think we've ever done it. But I grew up in a church where we had responsive reading. And the pastor would say something, and then the congregation would say something, and <clears throat> back and forth. Well, here at this at this covenant renewal, uh, the the Levites read the statutes of the covenant, and all the people, all two and a half million people or so, whatever was gathered there, the nation of Israel would respond, "Amen," and the Levites would read another statute and the people would respond amen and just just in case you know you don't know what amen means amen has a meaning it's not just a word we throw around let it be make it so that's what it means um so be it would be the best interpretation and so all the people they hear each rule come out from the priests and it booms out over the valley and then you have this massive roar of amen. I've never even seen two and a half million people together. I don't know what that would look like. It's got to be awesome. And then it would reverberate back across the mountain. I'm pretty stoked. Yeah. I, I want to see that. So you have this, this great big picture. Mount, something else that we're going to go just a little bit past because this is important. Mount Gerizim is uh, referred to as the mountain of blessing. Can you guys stand it? Can you guys go just a little bit longer? Mount Gerizim is referred to as the mountain of blessing. <clears throat> Mount Ebal is referred to as the mountain of cursing. Mount Gerizim has springs of water that flow, and, and it's, well, not really forested, but there's a lot of vegetation there. There's gardens on it. It's lush. It's green. It's a beautiful mountain. Mount Ebal is just a barren rock. There's nothing there. 
There is no blessing there. And the altar was built on a ball. God desires for us to live our lives on Mount Gerizim. Um, that's really a place of victory. That's, that's where we would like to stay. Unfortunately, we wind up over on Mount Ebal, and it's desolate, and it's rocky, and it's hard, and it's harsh. And it's not where you want to stay. But there is a picture of hope given to us because God, he, he put the altar over there. And when we can come to him and we can confess our sin and we can repent in that place, we can be restored to him, and we can get back over to Mount Gerizim. So, I hope that made sense, um, because it had an impact on me. I was super excited about it. Um, it it's just a, it's just a, a wonderful picture that, that um, if I were you guys, I would I'd go take a look at. Yes. You know, I don't know. It, it was not pointed out. I would imagine Israel is so small that we probably drove by it. We just didn't know what I was looking at. I wish that I had studied this this portion of the scripture and really, really had it down before we went because um, you go through a lot of these areas, and a lot of this stuff is still there. It's, it's, it's really neat. And afterward... He read all the words of the law, the blessing, the cursing, according to all the law that is written in the book of the law. There was not a word of all that Moses had commanded, which Joshua did not read before all the assembly of Israel, with the women, the little ones, and the strangers who were living among them. <clears throat> so, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just I, I thank you for your word. And, and um, just every picture that you put in the Old Testament, Lord, it, it, it just fires up my spirit, and, and I thank you for that. Um, you are a great God, and uh, you're worthy of our praise. And I just, I thank you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.